Well, greetings, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, again, this is uh, Dr. Horsey Smith, and I'm glad to be able to share with you again tonight uh, as we continue uh, in our devotionals uh, for this Lenten season and throughout the year, trying to uh, hone in on living life in the spirit. Again, that's that's the theme. Uh, that's the overall theme has been for some months now, really living life in the spirit. I know we have the Holy Spirit, uh, but I, I know that you understand this too, that you can you can have something but not be aware of it and, and therefore not benefit from it. Uh, we, we all need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to be uh, baptized filled with the Holy Spirit. But in this day of distraction, this day when so many things are happening everywhere in your, in your family and locally, regionally, uh, across the country and around the world, it's so easy to be caught up in what's going on around us and not really be aware and not really uh, be benefited much by what's happening inside of us, in our hearts, in our spirit. And that's what we mean, the overall thing, living life in the spirit. Uh, we've been talking about our corporate journey um, uh, in these last few weeks as we uh, use this Lenten season uh, to point toward Calvary. We're trying to also associate these devotionals uh, with the mission of Jesus, that he was on a mission. Uh, and as we study him, uh, we can see how focused he was. Uh, and not only that, but his attitude, his spirit, his intention. Because the more we know him, the more we're able to share him with others, the more we're able to be affected as a church, as individuals uh, called Christians, whose major assignment for all of us uh, is to spread this gospel. How do you do it? By being a witness. And so we've covered some of those basic scriptures about uh, being his witness, but we will continue. Uh, we are looking at for this entire uh, section, uh, Matthew 6 and 10, and Matthew 6, 31 through 33, because those two scriptures incorporate our overall view that our assignment uh, is the kingdom, the kingdom of God, uh, the sphere spiritually where God rules. And even though Jesus, of course, he established the kingdom, your job and my job is to expand the kingdom. It is to deepen the kingdom. It is to make sure that everyone uh, gets a chance to know Jesus and that those who know Jesus are deeply uh, impacted over and over again with knowing him better. So the witness is not only to those who are not saved, but to, to one another, to fellow Christians, to deepen uh, our experience and our knowledge, uh, our connection with the Lord Jesus. And so we're focused on him as we focus toward Calvary and then the resurrection. So again, in this segment, we've been talking about as our major scripture, Acts uh, chapter one, verse eight, uh, you shall, uh, shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And again, power to be my witnesses. And then the scope of that, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So for this week, uh, we added uh, to Acts chapter one and verse eight, uh, we added Acts chapter five, when the uh, court was upset, the court of, of Jerusalem, because, because of the witness of Peter and John and the other disciples that they had filled Jerusalem. All Jerusalem, he said, was filled uh, with knowledge of Jesus, so much so you have brought the blood of this man upon our hands. So clearly their witness was about Jesus. And they straightly, you know, threatened them, intimidated them, and the, not to teach nor preach anymore, no share in this man's name. See, when you really know Jesus, you, you're in love with him, uh, you embrace him, he becomes only your savior, but your, your Lord, and you are happy to be one of his vessels. That's what they were doing, the entire church. So again, the Lord then allowed, as the church grew and prospered in Jerusalem, became somewhat, somewhat complacent. Uh, the Lord sent persecution. They're being harassed. They're being hindered uh, by all those in that culture and those who are empowered. So much so that many of the saints in Jerusalem scattered uh, throughout uh, Judea and then to Samaria. That's where we left off earlier this week, that the gospel has been spread uh, from Jerusalem to Judea uh, to Samaria. We said in our own lives, Jerusalem is our family, uh, those who are very close to us. And then Judea, again, still familiar people, maybe our friends maybe our co-workers and others. But in Samaria, it's a little bit different. Samaria means a different, we used to call it a foreign uh, place, a place we are unfamiliar with. 
you know, we talked a little bit and we'll talk more about the Samaritans. And again, so we added the entire, uh, uh, sorry, eighth chapter of, of Acts, because the eighth chapter of Acts really is a transitional chapter, but it introduces to us uh, the practical implementation of Acts 1 and 8, when he says, be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. You'll see as you study Acts chapter 1, I mean, cha Acts chapter 8, the entire chapter, the rest of this week, and perhaps part of next week, you'll see that that eighth chapter is critical. Because you find out that indeed what the Lord had told them was implemented through persecution and other means from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then around the world. So let's let's pick it up. Let's read the first um, five verses uh, of Acts chapter one uh, in verse number eight uh, in the NIV. Let me read it to you. It says this: And Saul was there giving approval to his death, the death of Stephen, the first. Martyr. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. It says in verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, before his conversion, began to destroy the church. Notice, Saul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews, who loved the Mosaic law, who, who embraced it on the Sanhedrin. He hated the church. He felt that these Jesus believers were corruptors of Judaism, and he was committed. He was focused on creating one, uh, the King James says, creating havoc in the church. The NIV says he began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Then verse four, but those who had been scattered preached or shared the word wherever they went. Then it says something a, a little bit different. In verse 5, Philip, again, the evangelist, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. Notice, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the people of God are scattered. They share the word of God. But then once they receive the word of God, now the Lord uh, implores Philip to go to a city of Samaria. Again, you, you recognize Samaria as an unfamiliar territory. We are called to witness only to those that we're close to, but those that we are unfamiliar with. Maybe they're different uh, in ethnicity, in race, uh, different in gender, different in uh, economic status, uh, different in many ways. But again, we tend to be uncomfortable with people who are different than we are. But God give us the insight, uh, the courage, the wisdom. How do we connect with those uh, that are outside our normal sphere uh, of, of being and share with them in an effective and loving way the good news about Jesus Christ. That's what I think he means about Samaria. That's where they went. You remember that when Jesus in chapter four uh, said, I must needs go through Samaria. And when he approached this woman at the well, she was shocked. She said, how can you being a Jew uh, speak to me? A woman of Samaria, seeing that the Jews and the Samaritans have no deals with one another. They, they, they avoided each other. They thought each other to be less than. They looked down upon one another. And therefore, she was shocked that Christ would share with her. But Jesus, again, on his journey, showed us you must break down barriers. That's what he did. You know the story about how he witnessed it to her, kind of to a conversation with her about not only the water at the well, uh, but about that living water. And then he, and he, then he talked to her about uh, her status as a, as a woman of ill repute and she had been married so many times, and the one the Lord said she was living with was not her husband, but he converted her uh, again, and she became a, became a witness there in Samaria. That's why it's important to note in Acts chapter 8 that as, as the, as the uh, disciples went, they, the King James said they preached the word, really means they gossiped the word. They shared it in day-to-day -day knowledge and day-to-day -day language. But once Philip heard, that they had been doing this effectively, he now as a herald. Now, it's a difference uh, in his witness is not only what he shared about Christ in personal knowledge, he now is an official spokesman minister for Jesus Christ uh, in a way that carries an, a, a, an anointing that goes deep. And so, yes, the, the, the regular people of God soften the land, so to speak, 
to get hearts ready for Jesus. Now Philip goes and he begins to preach uh, Christ unto him. And, and again, when you read that about Philip, is very powerful. Let me begin, look at that, to read it to you uh, in parts of the beginning at verse 25. It says, um, or really verse 12, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, they were baptized, both men and women. So once Philip went and preached to them, they were baptized uh, uh, and so forth and so on. And then when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that they had heard Philip's word and were baptized, they sent Peter and John to lay hands on these new people, they might receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So again, the general saints are scattered. They witness the word of God. Philip hears about it. He says, brings his evangelistic anointing to that area. The apostles in Jerusalem hear about it. They send Peter and John to further uh, deepen this witness of Jesus. And now people not only uh, hear the word, they believe in faith, uh, they are baptized, and they receive the Holy Spirit. Very powerful. So now Samaria is becoming and will become very shortly because of this an entrenched area for the gospel. So again, from Jerusalem to Judea, Judea, Samaria. What about the othermost parts? The beginning is also here in chapter number eight. Let's, let's read verse 25 to 31. And it says in verse 25 in the NIV, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, that's Peter and John, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. They further embed this witness. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south, into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was returning from that worship in Jerusalem, and then in his chariot, he was reading the Old Testament scripture from the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, arise, go near, join him in the chariot. And he did that. And Philip ran and heard him reading the prophet. And Philip asked him, do you understand what you read? And look what the man says. How can I understand except some man, someone explains it to me. How, how can I know about this Christ like somebody guides me? Let's not forget that. We may come back to that. Look at the attitude of those who really believe the word of God when they first hear it. They want to know more about Christ. This man was a great man, this Ethiopian. He, he held all the treasury of Ethiopia, one of the greatest countries known on the planet. He was uh, an anointed man. He had a high place, a treasurer uh, in the court, again, of the queen of Ethiopia. And yet when he, he heard this word, he read it, and now Philip joins him and begins to explain to him, the Bible says, so, so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. He began to explain to him Jesus from that passage. Wow. Look at what, what's happening. The saints are scattered because of persecution. They leave Jerusalem. Some are still there. Most are still there, but many of them, again, are, are in Ju Judea and in Samaria. What are they doing? Sharing what they know about Jesus. Telling everybody what they knew about Jesus. Wow. Then Philip hears about it. He goes to the city of Samaria. And he begins to proclaim. He establishes a church in Samaria, the city of Samaria, in the city of Samaria, and people are baptized. And then the then the the, the apostles send their anointing, Peter and, and John. They come and lay hands on people. They receive the Holy Spirit. Do you see how important and how vital every anointing of witness is important, from the common person to the evangelists to the to the apostles. God uses the entire church to bring about knowledge of him. What part are you playing? What part am I playing? Are we, are we conscientiously, deliberately aware of how critical it is for every part of the body of Christ to be involved in the witness? And those, and those involvements are not simply separate. They are connected. Again, as I said on, on the last teaching, we should sit down and talk about how do we develop better courses for people to learn how to be a witness? 
How do we target certain groups that we may be unfamiliar with so we be, can become more effective and more intentional in the witness of Jesus Christ? We're doing this because Jesus, again, was focused on his mission, going to Calvary, knowing he'd be persecuted, knowing he would be beaten and, and abandoned. He did not allow the intimidation of violence or evil to stop him. And we should not become so complacent, so sad because we're saved that we don't have a love for others to be saved and to know Jesus. We should coordinate these efforts together. What a great God that we serve to assign this to us. Now remember, as we begin to do this and become a better witness, as you move out of your comfort zone, I guarantee you evil will rise up even further. It always happens when we are intentional about uh, being bold, being effective, or more open to Christ and what he wants us to do as individuals, as a church, we're going to experience again the attack of the enemy. That's supposed to happen. But what happens then again is that we continue on. And maybe even again, uh, the Lord sends the, the, the evil in a, in, a, in a certain way to kind of move us out of our comfort zone. Uh, you know, let me quickly tell you a story. My wife said, I'm getting old and telling these stories. You know, there was a woman who uh, loved the Lord and, and, and did her best to follow Christ, was a giver, was a, a praying woman. And, and, and she, was, she, she was devastated because she had lost all she had and she was hungry. And she said, Lord, I know you're God and there's nothing too hard for you. I need food. And I believe, Lord, you'll supply my need. And the two little boys heard her praying. So let's play a joke on her. So they went to the store, they bought all this food, this great food. They put it in a, in a basket and put it by her door and knocked on the door and ran away. Of course, the woman came out and said, praise God. God has answered my prayer and sent me food. Uh, and, and, and the little boy said, laughing and said to her in derision, God isn't that food. We, we brought it. And she said, you may have brought it, but God sent it. What are you saying? That sometime the trouble in our life is really a result of the enemy knowing that we're getting serious about Christ or the reverse. We get so complacent, God allows the enemy to shake us up. Why? So that we will be reawakened to the call of God upon our lives. God didn't save us to be complacent. Yeah, he wants us to enjoy life. I believe that, St. John 10 and 10, life in all its fullness, physically, spiritually, emotionally, economically, relationally, all those things are promise of God. But as we do those things, as we live our lives, we must understand our lives don't belong to us. They belong to him. And I hope that we will again uh, become deeply in, in, encouraged and intense as individuals and as a group to witness to Jesus Christ. This world's in so much trouble. You know all of that are happening locally and around the world. Boy, Jesus needs somebody that will be aware of him in their own lives, to allow a greater awareness of the person, the presence. Listen, saints, I know you're saved, but the attitude of Jesus, when you experience Christ, you take on his attitude. You react in a way that people know that wasn't you. That was the Lord in you, yes. And that's how you are effective in winning them to Jesus. People need to see what we talk about, but we must talk about it as well. We must not be reluctant to share him, to talk about Jesus, to talk about what it has meant in your life to be impacted by the baptism of Christ in your life. So again, God bless you. Uh, continue to join us uh, in these endeavors. As I say all the time, you get out of this. Ask the Lord to give you others to connect with you in these devotions. Maybe this will be a tool of witness. that They become, again, attached to Christ uh, through your encouragement to join us daily. Uh, in this walk. Take some time, again, each week as we approach, uh, again, uh, Calvary and the resurrection of fasting uh, and prayer and in devotion, and really to ask the Lord, help us to be better witnesses. As we get deeper into these weeks, last few weeks, again, before we call Easter resurrection, we'll talk about what was exactly on the mind of Jesus. We'll try to trace his steps those last few weeks uh, as he steadfastly looked toward his mission at Calvary and the resurrection. Hey, I love you. Uh, we love you, my wife and I, and our family. Thank you for being so kind to us uh, this past week in our 42nd pastoral anniversary. 
So many of you have sent things to us and greeted us, and we know you all love us, and we return that love back to you. We love the fact that God allows us uh, access uh, into your life. Again, the Lord bless you and keep you. We want to make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord each day lift up his countenance upon you and your family and your loved ones and give you shalom, give you peace in Jesus' name.